Hi, it's Craig here, and uh, this is the second week uh, feedback video. Uh, this is Richard, and Richard, as you can see, has changed his hairstyle this week. Uh, no, it's not actually Richard. Uh, Sherelle, welcome. Uh, Thank you. It's a pleasure to be uh, in the studio helping yeah. facilitate this feedback video. Yeah, this fantastic. Week. Richard's not able to be with us today, but um, Jen and Sherelle, um, you would know from the uh, discussion boards mm -hmm. and providing so much great feedback. And there's, again, plenty of uh, rich discussion. We've tried to distill out some of the key things for this week, sure. and we'll explore them now. So, great, great. Yeah. so there was a lot of um, interesting questions coming up. We've got a, some new steps in the course this particular mm -hmm. run getting a little bit more research in based on people that were asking a lot of questions about that in the past. Um, you know, how mindfulness can affect the brain and the body, um, how it influences health in particular. There's been a little bit of um, scepticism around some of this research that yeah. I think would be good to address. Yeah, sure. Well, um, what Richard and I tried to do was to give a distillation of some of the key things that have been studied. In terms of the number of studies, depending on which databases you look at, they're between, say, close to 700 or up to 1,000 uh, new papers last year alone uh, on mindfulness. Now, you've got to say it's very hard to attract big research dollars Definitely. for mindfulness research compared to a new drug or, um, or some other thing that has a patentable kind of um, uh, quality to sure. it. So there are some really high-quality um, uh, trials um, or an accumulation of a number of trials over over time. Some of the trials are smaller. Sure. Um, uh, the methodology, uh, you know, can vary a little bit depending on the researcher's experience and so on. You'd have to say there's a lot accumulating, and it would be a very fair comment to say that um, there are certainly plenty of gaps. But there's often a lot more research than people realise. Sure. If if learners are ever interested in searching on any particular yes. topic, um, PubMed is one um, good source to go to. So just Google PubMed, P-U-B-M-E-D. We can put a link to that. At the yeah, end of this that's video. right. And then you can go there and search mindfulness and, you know, heart disease or mindfulness and depression, and it'll bring up all of the studies up um, that uh, link into that. So, um, but certainly it's accumulating, but there are many gaps uh, or the need for really good quality sure, trials. Sure, And I think another thing that's been a bit challenging with the research is um, a lot of studies have initially just looked at, you know, people doing a six-week course, but have they been practicing at home? And a lot of the yeah. re earlier research didn't do that. It just said, okay, these are people that did a, a course and this is what the effect is, but I think more very recent research is starting to tease out exactly what are they doing and how much practice are they doing. I think that's really important. That's right. Yeah. Because to say, oh, does mindfulness work or not? Mm -hmm. Well, it depends on whether a person practices and applies it. So you could go and go to a class, go to an exercise class, and uh, then go to another exercise mm -hmm. class, but not do any exercise in between. No, it didn't increase my fitness. I don't think it works. <laughs> Yeah, we don't want to dismiss it too quickly, do we? We want to really right. give it a go. And there were questions about how long do I need to practice in order to get some benefits. And mm. certainly a number of the studies, you know, are looking at six or eight week courses and noticing a, a significant change in that time. But I think, uh, you know, certainly in my practice, having a couple of decades now, you know, those practice effects get deeper over time. So that's don't right. think in six weeks, well, that's it. I'm mindful now and I can stop. I would recommend keep going and yeah. uh, just see how far you can go. Like one example is, um, you know, uh, uh, the work by Herbert Benson and his mm. team looking at the effect of, um, of meditation practices on the epigenetic expression of the genes that code for stress. Great. And, um, and what they found was that the, the effect was measurable on the very first time a person practiced that yeah, exercise. Okay. So the, the, the stress gene, if you like, just quietened down a bit. And then it very quickly went back to where it was before. <laughs> and so, and mind you, it could reflect uh, activity of the amygdala mm -hmm. changes, but very quickly goes back to where it is before. Mm -hmm. And that's where it really needs to be practiced and established over a number of weeks for those changes to be deeper mm -hmm. and to be more consistent. So a person might say, oh, it's a very short change in how I felt, but I quickly went back to where I was before. But maybe two months later, a person might be saying, no, I'm, I'm experiencing that mm -hmm. uh, more often and for longer. Sure, mm. sure. And I think a, a key aspect of mindfulness that helps is the stress relieving mm. qualities that it kind of brings. And sometimes people might say, well, is it the mindfulness then or is it the fact that you've reduced stress? I think, you know, for some of these areas, there could be other things people could be doing to reduce stress and improve their health. We're not saying mindfulness is the only thing that can cure all <laughs> yeah. of these possible ailments. Um, but we know that it's a particularly effective one in, in a number of areas. Yeah. And say something like blood pressure. Mm. You practice a technique like this and there will mm. tend to be a, a drop in the blood pressure. Mm. But again, 
unless it, you know, it can go back to where it was before. Is it the mindfulness or is it the stress relieving properties? Well, it's hard to separate mindfulness from its stress relieving properties if we're truly mindful. Like it's a little bit hard to separate the sun from its rays. And it's like um, the, the one follows on from the other because the stress is, or the anxiety is so often being driven by not being mindful by getting anxious about mm. the hundred things I've got to do today layer, layer, or, layer on top. or recreating stress from things in the past. And sure. so we help to protect ourselves from that. And we've had um, an interesting discussion around why don't doctors prescribe mindfulness. And as a medical <laughs> doctor, Craig, we thought we should get your perspective on this. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think what we've found, and we have done some, uh, published some research on this, mm. uh, our medical students at Monash are trained in mindfulness. And when we survey them late in the medical course, we find that the majority of them say, oh, I would be prescribing mindfulness to help people with mental health problems like sure. depression, with chronic pain, to help people to cope with major illnesses like cancer and so on. And this would be, one would have to say, pretty appropriate and consistent with the evidence. Where we surveyed students from other um, uh, medical courses that don't get training in mindfulness and they're very unlikely sure. um, to recommend it for anything whether it was valid or invalid um, indication. So I, think so I think it's really about being informed about it. Definitely, mm. definitely. And likewise, there was a question around, you know, why are some patients resistant to mindfulness? And again, I think it's just a lack of familiarity. You, you sort of need that personal experience of it, I think, to really understand mm. it. And sometimes that some of the media uh, can be positive around mindfulness and sometimes there is a little bit of backlash. There was a Mm. paper published us this week that was um, a little bit critical of some of the mm. research areas that we sort of mentioned above that yeah. um, often people have misperceptions around what mindfulness is. I think mm. it's you have certain rigid practices and they can't do that but when they look at mm. attention training exercises it becomes a lot more accessible and, yeah. and easier to implement. And I think too with any things like with lifestyle change in general you know when something requires more effort and uh, personal interaction it's often a, a, a less palatable thing sure. than, oh, maybe I can have a pill for that. Yeah. And so I think there's a kind of resistance that we all tend to have to putting in the effort to make help ourselves to make change. It can be tricky. Yeah. And um, A lot of interest in the brain. Yeah, a lot of interest mm. in the brain. So there was a good question Probably. around, um, you know, research showing increases in brain matter, brain volume. Mm. Uh, one person asked, does that happen in older people? I have found one study that looked particularly at uh, older adults. Um, it's probably not an area that has had a lot of sort of research, but it'd be good to see more work on. But um, certainly our personal experience with some of our older learners is that these practices are making a big difference. Yes, it, there seems to be um, accumulating evidence to improve cognitive performance. Mm. Uh, a little bit of evidence to show that the brain retains its capacity to make new brain cells even into old age. So you might find yourself needing a larger hat size uh, after a year or two. <laughs> Maybe not quite that much. <laughs> not, not quite that much. We're talking about very small increments. Sure. But what it does seem to do at very least is slow down or even halt the expected uh, rate of um, thinning of sure. the cortex. And um, we don't know yet the full therapeutic potential. All we know is that the signposts are, are certainly pointing in a very interesting direction. Sure. And there were a lot of questions, particularly around um, dementia and, and one around non-cancerous brain mm. lesions that might appear with age. Have you got anything to share? Um, well, is, with dementia, things that increase the grey matter in the hippocampus, memory centres, mm. executive functioning areas would have to mm. um, be taken as, as something possibly helpful for preventing dementia. A few early studies are yeah. uh, coming out, uh, including one we've been doing here at Monash on um early cognitive impairment and um, with some positive findings but you'd have to be you know cautious with sure. um, jumping to too, too many conclusions but room for optimism. I haven't really seen studies looking at say non-cancerous brain lesions um, no. and mindfulness. Um, I don't know if research has been done, I have to do a search but I certainly haven't come across any in um, sure. what I've um, seen so far. And it's hard to cover every possible exact application mm. that we could have mm. for mindfulness but yeah we're trying to focus more on on the key ones that we see a yeah. lot of research in. now Cheryl do you wake up every morning thinking about your insula <laughs> <laughs> no it's not something that I think about but Neil well, did mention in one of the videos <laughs> didn't he about um, mindfulness helps create a thicker sort of insula and there was that question about you know the insula is related to detecting sensations in your body and he was mm. asking well hold on if you're anxious often people are worried about sensations in their body heart pounding and mm. does that make a problem and I think you've got to keep in mind the amygdala is also reducing so you might become more aware but also less reactive to it able to acknowledge what it is okay it's a physical symptom but I can do some breathing I can do some things to help calm that down yeah 
And the that um, area of the brain <clears throat> responding, the insula, is like a part of the self-awareness. And it's our way of noticing the things we notice. Because with anxiety, you know, we, we notice you know, a wave of anxiety, and then there's this emotional reactivity to it, which, of course, makes us hypervigilant for it, fixes the attention on it until it just dominates, and so we escalate it. If we can learn to notice in a mindful way, it's with the noticing, oh, there's that experience, that sensation, but just noticing it in a less reactive way, less uh, resistance to it, less fighting with it. Um, less need to, because when we try to get rid of something, we actually become more conscious of it, exactly. rather than noticing it, but just gently engaging the attention with what we're doing. Sure. So it's our way of noticing that really matters yeah. as well. So there was also a bit of discussion around work performance, which is actually a bit of a key topic for next week. So we might save some questions uh, around that, but mindful teaching and, and learning kind of came up as well. And mm. one day teachers can definitely get quite overwhelmed by a lot of administrative work now, you know, emails, um, curriculums continuing mm. to expand and all the different things that teachers need to kind of do. Um, but but we do know that mindfulness can really help teachers um, and students as well. Mm. Did you want to talk a little bit about teachers? Well, look, I think it's tremendous. I mean, look, the first thing in teaching mindfulness to a child is to be mindful with the child. Yeah. Um, and for a teacher to be modelling that, calmer and attentive, not multitasking, really communicating and engaging with the child. But the self-awareness as well, to notice when you've got 25 children in the classroom perhaps, they're all pressing your buttons because they've learned where your buttons are so they know how to press them. And, um, and But to be able to see the reaction arise. But that little little standing back from it and that window of opportunity to choose to respond or how to respond can be a game changer because if that response is not discerning, we escalate a situation. If it's more discerning, we can maybe navigate our way through it um, and deal with it differently. So it's tremendous to see that and and, and uh, when not just teachers but parents can exactly. be mindful with their children then they are teaching mindfulness. Yeah and I think mindfulness at home you know not just expecting a school to teach your child mindfulness if you can just role modeling it at home I think is, is yeah. probably the best thing. Yeah um, and of course kids dealing with all the technology and, and things these days. That, it's, uh, it's huge there's mm -hmm. there's a lot to deal with and we've already talked a bit about social media I think last week one particular mm -hmm. area but uh, you know the overwhelm sometimes of information so taking some time out um, having some breaks from all of that technology really connecting you know one-on-one -on -one with our kids I think mm -hmm. is, is very valuable. Yeah yeah the um, lots of metaphors metaphors are often mm -hmm. a great way of understanding things like uh, and, you know, swimming. You don't want to start to learn to swim when you've yeah, been thrown in the one. water and so on. And um, uh, But also, uh, many are really noticing how much of the time the mind is preoccupied and, about, and worrying about the future. Mm -hmm. And the worry about the future is different to planning and preparing for the future okay. in a more conscious way. And uh, so there are lots of great recognitions about all of that. Sure. Um, perfectionism uh, came up too, didn't it, as a, yeah. a source of um, uh, stress for a lot of people because they're thinking that everything has to be the utmost best that they can do, but acknowledging that it doesn't have to be perfect, it can be good enough for now, can be um, very helpful mm. for a lot of people. Yeah, and just making mistakes. I mean, we're human. Mm. We make mistakes. If we're mindful, we acknowledge it, um, can address our attention to it, learn something from it, move on. <laughs> And even one learner herself was, you know, acknowledging self-criticism for herself, watching the video about stress relieving. And she's like, you know, and what do I do around this? And, and I can't notice my stress reactions early enough and judging myself for not being able to do that. And we, mm. Okay, she could see really quickly when we had some discussion on the forum that, you know, noticing that it's difficult is, is the first point, you know, mm. and that she, she's mm. already making progress already just in, in the short time of the course. Yeah. But don't be too hard on yourself. Yeah. Uh, give some time for these practices to work. Yeah. And training the puppy as well, that, to get the sense of the gentleness mm. with which we um, help ourselves to become more mindful. Sure. Uh, and, um, and that is a really um, valuable message that's been taken on by a lot of people. Curiosity came up as a Curiosity. bit of a... Curiosity, yeah. yeah. A, a, a lot of people really love this concept of curiosity and can see that when you're curious in something, it's easier to be engaged in it and, and really focus your attention. Um, but some did find being curious about the breath in particular a, a challenge. And I've suggested to a few maybe using the term I'm interested in rather than curious because curious often invites a lot of questioning and seeking and looking for answers. And we're really just trying to observe what's happening more than trying to understand why and how <laughs> you're breathing a little bit. But yeah. uh, that could be a helpful thing to do. But th that curiosity, that sort of interest, that noticing, because we might be sitting there and, and practicing and the breath is going in and it's going out. Mm. 
And as we're sitting there, I think, why do I want to be curious about the breath? I don't know. I don't get the point. What's, <laughs> what about the breath? I don't it just, just I mean, it's the same old breath that happens all the time. What's, that, what's the big deal? And we haven't actually noticed because we're not curious that we're not paying attention to the breath. Yes. The attention's attention on an internal trail. dialogue yeah. with ourselves about, uh, you know, I don't see the point and uh, I'm bored and I want to do something else. And unless we're curious, we won't notice this very subtle layer sure. of thinking and distraction. Sure. So being curious about the breath means that in the process of that, we might start to notice more things happening, you know, getting curious and just noticing what's moving in the bushes, as it were. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and we might notice some patterns of thought we were unaware of that sure. may be going on in the background of our lives much of the time. Definitely. And there were some questions too around, uh, um, should I be trying to deepen my breath like I might do in yoga? Mm. I think it's okay just to observe the breath as it is. Of course, if you notice there's some tension, I think it's helpful then to try one or two deeper breaths. Yeah. We don't have to observe there's tension in the body and therefore I must hold on to it because I'm being mindful and I'm just observing. We can mm. then respond to it in an appropriate way. Yeah. Um, yawning came up, a lot of people mentioning yawning and it might just be that they're feeling a bit sleeper, sleepy. Um, maybe one learner shared an article around um, yawning bringing cooler blood to the brain. That wasn't something that we were familiar with but it could be a, a reason why sometimes we're trying to yawn to get a little bit more mm. alert as well. Yes, yeah. Um, moving during mm. the practice as well, I would, like with pain or an itch or something, Move or not. I mean, if we're doing an injury to the body, uh, you know, move. Um, sometimes we might choose a posture. You know, we've got quite bad back pain. We might find it easier to lie down and so on. Sure. And sometimes uh, we're sitting there and there is a discomfort, but we're just, and, and especially for pain patients, we, we're learning to work with the discomfort. Yeah. Uh, the emotions and reactions to it. You know, the itch is an interesting one, though. It's, it's surprising how many itches just come out of nowhere when you sit down to practice meditation. Now, there, <laughs> I think there are two ways to go with this. There is, um, I suppose, the, the beginner's practice, which is to sit there and then just to mindfully scratch the itch. Right? So that's, but the really um, advanced practice is to sit there and just notice the air. <laughs> <laughs> and Not react. Part. And just watch those waves of intense irritation just come and go. And that's a very advanced and very challenging practice. <laughs> I have. I, I did do a retreat where they did actually encourage us to do that very much. And it was interesting to explore that a lot of those things do actually pass with time of if course. you don't get reactive to them. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah. If something's a concern, I think address it. Yeah. Um, switching between techniques and, and blending techniques was another thing that came up. Um, mm. We want you to experiment and see what works best for you. Um, but you know, trying not to chop and change too much, I think, can be a challenge. We're trying to dig deep, you know, in, in one area rather yeah. than sampling too many and things. I think, I think. Yeah, and if you if you know what you're practicing when you sit down, like if you're going to practice some mindfulness, then sit down and practice that. And then. If at another time you want to practice something else, then sit down and, and practice and work with that. But I, I think it, it's it's best um, to know what it is is sitting down to practice rather than the mind. Oh, I do. Oh no, I do, I'll do. Oh no, I'll do yeah, something else. And all of a sudden, the mind's not. Um, Got not anywhere mindful. to sit. <laughs> and informal practice, I think, is the last thing we really need to address yeah. today around, you know, a number of daily activities learners recognise that they could do more mindfully. And there were a few questions around, you know, is some autopilot okay? Mm. Well, look, I mean, if, if we're walking through the park, we can certainly give some attention to a problem or an issue. We could be driving. Some people say, look, I've got a half hour drive. I want to be thinking and planning and everything else. Well, it may affect the driving um, or, you know, we may not have our attention on the road when we need it. That's one thing. Um, but the second thing is that we may give better quality attention. Sure. Uh, if we say, well, okay, I've just noted there's something I need to deal with, but maybe I get home, drive home mindfully and safely, but get home and I sit at my desk, have a couple of minutes to be mindful and now address this problem or issue or planning, but with real quality attention. And we may find that's a better and more efficient way to do it. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah. So All that's right. it for today, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, so a lot to cover. And, and uh, thank you very much again for all your comments. And thank you to Jen and Sherelle for providing such great support. And we'll look forward to um, Richard's uh, company next week. We'll be exploring things like multitasking, um, performance and learning. And some of the cognitive aspects of mindfulness can be helpful as well. And please do know that there's a second course, mm -hmm. um, the six-week course as it used to be, is two four-week courses. And the uh, next four-week course around mindful living will be um, coming up as well. So you might want to explore some of these topics in, in more depth.
Definitely, yeah. Some of the questions that have come up this week around sort of social issues and things I think would be better uh, dealt with in, in the following course as well. So we look forward to that as well.